All right, hello again, and welcome to our class today. All right, we've got to set this uh, to start here. All right, the game pin is on screen, so go to kahoot.it, enter your pin, Do you mind sharing your screen again? We can't. Oh, see what a great! Oh, I'm shared. sorry. You know, I got to remember to do things like that. One second. All right. So I think everyone's logged in. Let's go ahead and play Family Feud. John Christensen places a buy limit order at 42 when the market price of the stock is at 45. How would the order fill? A. Filled immediately because the market price is already above 42. B. Filled, bet filled, when the, filled between when the stock price is between 42 and 45. C. Filled when the stock price is 42 or lower. Or D. Filled at the next available price after the stock drops to 42. All right, this was a tricky one. Buy limit order at 42. Okay, so as a buy order, buy limit price, pay no more than 42 for it, and the stock's at 45. So if the price, so the current price is above the current above his limit price. When would the how would the order fulfill? It wouldn't fill immediately because the market right he doesn't want the, he's it's more than he wants to pay for it. When the stock price is 42 or lower, that's exactly what a limit price would do. That's okay because he's paying, setting a limit to the most he's willing to pay for it. All right, very well done. Okay, Kimberly, Hannah, and Karina are on the board. Next question. If left unexecuted, a good till cancel order will automatically cancel the win. A, on the last business day of June and the last business day of December. B, on the first business day of April and the first business day of October. C, on the cancel date specified by the customer when the order was entered. Or E, on the last business day of April and the last business day of October. Best answer choice, yes, is all open orders, right? The, the exchanges have to have to have to basically clear their books of all open, unfulfilled, good till canceled orders on the last business day of April and the last trading day of October. And the way I remember that, well, what's the last day of October? Halloween. So it's Halloween and six months after that. That's how I remember that one. Uh, let's see. Okay, Alexis and Ashley are moving up. Kimberly keeps a pretty solid lead, though. That's our next question. A customer enters the following order. Sell 1,000 shares of XYZ at 23. Which execution would the customer accept? A, 2290. B, 2125. C, 22. Or D, 2350. Right, did great. Yes, sell XYZ at 23. That's a limit order. You can right if I don't make any type of mention about it, I just give you a price, it's understood that that's a limit price. Sell for no less than 23. Well, there's only one that person would accept 23.50, right? At their limit or better. In this case, it was this case it was 50 cents better. All the other three, less than they would willing to accept. All right, Kimberly's three in a row and a commanding lead. Let's check our next one. 
How long can a good till cancel order remain in force without being reconfirmed by the customer? A, six months, B, 12 months, C, 24 months, three, D, 36 months. Nice, yes. Knowing that all good till cancel orders have to be cleared out, have to be canceled by April, last trading day of April, last trading day of October. So the most they can stay in force is six months. Now, in reality, by the way, firms will have their own uh, policies on how long they'll keep a GTC order open. Where I used to work, they would cancel them after 60 days. So they would just let them go out right, just cancel after 60 days. Okay. Kimberly's four in a row. Karina, Jason, and Ashley move up. Let's check. Next one. A client with no other positions in her margin account is bearish on ABC stock. What transaction would you recommend? A, buy ABC to close. B, buy ABC to open. C, sell ABC to close. D, sell ABC to open. person chose this one because she's bearish on ABC stock, right? She expects ABC to go down. So what type of transaction does someone go down to, right? Oh, they do a short sale. So she would sell it short, which would be, a, so her first transaction, right? Initial transaction would be to sell something or sell to open. How would she get out of that short position? She'd have to buy it back again. She'd buy to close, sell to open, buy to close. Most people chose sell to close, which we should do, she would do if she already owned ABC stock and then wanted to get rid of it. Okay, does opening equal short? Opening just means your first transaction, the initial transaction that would create a new investment in someone's portfolio. Now, many, I think the obvious one, of course, is someone buys an investment and sells it later. So that would be a buy to open followed by a sell to close. But this case is the other way around. Her first transaction is to sell something. So she would sell to open and later on buy to close. Question is, how do you know she doesn't own it? What it tells, it tells us a client with no other position in her margin account. So she does, right? She has no nothing in her portfolio right now. So that's one way you, that she knows, that we know about. That's a little clue that told us. All right. Anything else about that? Is that is, if it's not totally clear, please let me know, okay? All right, let's get our next one. Oh, what does ABC open again? Okay, well, if it's an opening transaction, which means it's your first transaction, an opening transaction, the one that creates a new investment in your portfolio. Now, of course, you can make an opening purchase by buying an investment for the first time, or in a short sale, right, your first trade is to sell something. Yes, Karina? If you didn't own it, then why do we, like, why does she have to worry about it if it's, she doesn't have a position in it? Well, she doesn't own it, but she's bearish on the stock. She expects ABC to go down. So as such, she could sell ABC stock short, which remember that which means she would borrow shares of ABC stock and sell them, get the money to deposit into her account, but can't take that out because she'd have this liability. She would owe her broker dealer shares of ABC stock coming up short, hmm, ABC stock, which she'd have to replace later on. All right, thanks, Karina. I think virtual thumbs up. Hope that made sense. It's Alexis who got the score this time and moved into the lead. A client has owned QRS for a few years, but now has turned bearish on QRS. What transaction would you recommend? A, buy QRS to close. B, sell QRS to open. C, sell QRS to close. B, buy QRS to open. Because it was something, right, the client has already owned QRS stock or is long QRS stock and now turned bearish about it, okay? Was bullish, now bearish. She, right, our client wants to get out of this position. And so she already had an opening position, had already opened QRS stock. It's time to close it. Sell to close. 
Okay, what does bearish mean in this context? Okay, that's, that's not silly at all, by the way. Um, bullish, the terms bullish and bearish represent uh, someone's, uh, they call it sentence, a sentiment, but it really means somebody's opinion about where they think the direction is going to go. Right? If someone thinks, is looking at a stock and they think it's going to go up, they're said to be bullish on that stock, or maybe they're bullish on the whole market. So if it's something that things are going to go up, they probably want to buy into it. They probably want to buy it now, right? buy to open. Uh, bearish, however, well, that means someone with the opposite opinion. They look at the same investment, but they come away with a different opinion. They think it's going to go down. They're said to be bearish on that investment. Maybe they're bearish on the whole market. So they think it's on its way down. So if they already owned it, like in this case, they'd want to get rid of it. Is it a negative connotation for bearish? I'm not, well, let's just say it's their opinion they think it's going to go down. Okay. From their point of view, if they were right and they sold it short, it, it would be a good thing from their point of view. Yes, Alexis. In one of my old classes, like the study materials that I use, um, I got taught that think of it as a bull's horns go up. So they want the market to go up and a bear's claws go down. So right. they want the market to go down. Yeah, that, that's the where there's well, supposedly where these animal metaphors come from, right? When a bull attacks, it points with its horns and strikes upwards. So if you think it's going to go up, you're said to be bullish. When a bear attacks, it rears with its claws and strikes downwards. So that's why they think it's bear if it goes down. That's that's the supposedly where those those terms come from. Okay, glad you like that, Amy. Okay. When we talk about options today, bullish and bearish is going to be really important today. So it's probably good that we've had this chance to mention it. All right. All right. Ashley moving up the board. Alexis, streak of five. Smoking. Which of the following best describes how a buy stop at 39 would fill? A, the next price at 39 after the market price is 39. B, the next price after the market price rises at 39. C, the next available price after the market price falls to 30. Be the next price below 39 after the market falls to 30. Right, as a buy stop order, all right, so a buy stop, so someone wants to buy it at a stop price. Now remember the buy stop is a slobs order, slobs above, right? That's the BS in slobs or buy stop is placed above the current price. This order says if it goes up to 39, enter a market order to buy once it touches or crosses 39. So it would be the next best available price after the order rises to 39. It would not be the next price above 39, it's just the next price. Whether it's above 39, equal to 39 or below 39, it becomes a market order and executes. At 39. Had it been a stop limit order at 39, yeah, that would say, you know, but pay no more than 39. So that might be the case, okay? But not after the market price falls. For the price to fall, it would have to be a sell stop. That says before it goes down to this price, sell. All right. And okay, Kimberly racking up some points. Next question. Which best describes how a market order to buy would fill if placed when the market price of the stock was at 40? A, the next available price above 40. B, the next available price. C, the next available price below 40. D, only at 40. opinion here but market order means when they place a market order they're going to get market price whatever that price is when their order gets to the stock exchange or really gets to the front of the line at the stock exchange okay or gets to a market making desk so market order means you'll get market price whatever that is at that particular moment now chances are very high that if it was price was 40 that they'll get it at 40 but there's just that possibility it's a small chance but it is there that the price could move up or down from 40, just whatever the price is, when their order, the moment their order gets to the front line of the stock exchange. That's the idea of a market order, right? Guaranteed execution, but no guarantee of price. Actually moving up the board. All right, let's check our next one. 
Which of the following best describes how a sell stop order at 39 would, would be filled? A, the next level price after the market price falls to 39. B, the next price above 39 after the market rises to 39. C, the next available price after the market price rises to 39. Or D, the next price before 39 after the market falls to 39. Yes, as a sell stop order, right? That's a bliss order. Okay, below the current price, that's the SS and Bliss sell stop. If it's at which says if, are, if the stock ever trades at or below 39 to it or through it, then but only then, uh, the order is activated or elected is the ter technical term, and becomes a market order to sell and therefore sells at whatever the price is after it hits or crosses 39. That's the best best description. Nice one. All right, so some people putting up some points here. Let's check our next one. Last one. A market order to buy must be executed when and at what available price? A, within 24 hours at the highest. B, within 24 hours at the lowest. C, immediately at the lowest or immediately at the highest. Good deal. First off, it's not within 24 hours. Remember, market orders are instant execution, right? Okay, you got trade at market, not within 24 hours, instantly. All right, literally, they have was supposed to have one second to execute the order. That's all done electronically, of course, but you no, know, that's when they're supposed to do it. Now, since it's a buy order, well, we have to look out for our customer's price. Are they going to buy at the? They want to buy at the lowest available price or the highest available price? No, they want to buy at the lowest available price, right? That would be the ask price. The ask price is the lowest price that anybody's out there willing to sell it for at this particular moment. Had it been a market order to sell, of course, then it would sell at the bid price, which is represents the highest price that anybody's willing to buy it for at that particular moment. Uh, misread it. Okay, it happens, right? Okay. Yes, we have to be ever so careful about the about reading the orders because they're trying. Just remember, they're trying to catch you off guard. That's why paying attention to detail is so, prom so important, and practice is so very important. All right, well, how do we do? <laughs> okay, in third place, bronze medal, it is Ashley. And in second place, silver medal, it is Kimberly. And in first place, gold medal and Olympic champion, Alexis. Time to this round of applause for all our players today. Wonderful. All right. Applause and horns are exploding confetti for everybody. Nicely done. Okay. Let me have to pause the recording here. Okay, so great job with the uh, with the uh, cahoots there. I hope that helped you out a little bit. Again, again, that's why you know, keep on practicing. The more you do it, just you just get the feel for it. You get better at it. All right, so we're gonna talk now about something well, I sure get a lot of questions about, and that is options. All right, here's the thing with options. It's a little it's not always intuitive to begin, but once you got it, you got it. There's a method to it. There's a logic to it. And once you have that down, uh, and I'm going to share with you everything I, I can tell you about options. Here's the thing about what options are. Options, just this, options are a contract between the two investors. In this contract, they've agreed with each other that they would trade 100 shares of a stock right, at a pre-agreed price. No matter what the actual price is, they agreed they trade at a fixed price, no matter what the actual price is. As always, there's there's a contract. There's always two sides to a contract. On one side is the option buyer, who's also called the option holder, right? Who purchased this option contract, right? And having paid, well, what they paid is called the premium. That's the price they pay. But what they paid for is a contract that gives them the right. Now it's not an obligation for them, but it's the right to trade 100 shares of stock at a fixed price, no matter what the actual price is. Basically, by buying this option contract. They have paid to lock in their price for a limited time. Limited because all options have an expiration date. Okay. Uh, question, can you have a long week this week? Can I make assignments due on Wednesdays instead of Mondays? I, I put it this way. I had to put something, of course, in the syllabus, but I'm not so concerned when it gets done as long as it gets done. <laughs> okay. So if you had a hard week this week, I'm all right if you bring it Wednesday rather than Monday. Okay, but of course, 
you know, we try to keep up as best we can so that we're you know, making progress on schedule. Oh, you said you can't see the screen. What a great idea if I could actually share my screen with you. Hold on a second. Okay. All right. So, again, here's the deal with options. A contract between two people. One side is the option buyer, who's also called the holder. And remember, when someone buys something, we say they're long the option or long that investment. They pay a premium. That's the price they paid for the contract. And the contract gives them a right, not an obligation, to trade 100 shares of stock at a fixed pre-agreed price, no matter what the actual price is. That fixed price, by the way, it is called a strike price, sometimes called an exercise price. So like I said, what they've done is they paid, a, they paid to lock in their price for a limited time. Now, again, the phrase is long and short. Remember, this is industry jargon. And in this jargon, long means to own. So if you bought like 200 shares of Nike, go around telling people, yeah, I'm long 200 Nike. Sounds more impressive, than that, right? And since it's something they own, this is an asset. The holder or buyer of an option contract, or is long the option, has an asset, and the asset is a contract that lets them trade at a fixed price, no matter what the actual price is. Depending how things go, that could be a very valuable asset too. On the other side of the transaction, always two sides. If someone buys something, someone else has to sell it to them. So the option seller, who's also known as the option writer, we also say is short the option. Now, from their perspective, the seller who received the premium, in exchange for the money, the premium that they received, they have entered into a contract, and now they have to do what the contract says if the option buyer asks them to do it. We say they're short the option. Short means to owe, right? Like you're coming up short, okay? These shares of stock or something, and this is a liability. All right, and the liability of an option writer or seller is they have to live up to the terms of the contract. Depending how things go, that could be a very big liability too. There are two types of options. After all, there's two types of trades you can make. You can buy something or sell something. So that's why there are two types of options. You have a call option. The holder or owner of a call option has a right to buy 100 shares of stock at a fixed price, to call it to them at this fixed price. Do they have to use the option? No, it's a right. It's not an obligation. They don't have to, but if it's profitable, they certainly will. If it's not profitable, they certainly won't. <laughs> okay. But the person who sold them that option right, has to do with the contract. So if the whole holder says, I'm going to exercise, use my call option. I'm going to buy the stock from you. I'm going to call it to me at the price we agreed. Well, the person who go, sold them that option has to live up to the contract, has to sell that stock to them at the pre-agreed fixed price, no matter what the actual price is. There's another trade you can make, though. You can sell something. Okay. So a contract, so a put option is a contract where the holder has the right to sell 100 shares of stock to someone else at the strike price, at a fixed price, no matter what the actual price is. When they buy a put option, they've paid to lock in their sell price now, right? To sell to somebody else or put it to somebody else at the strike price. The person who gave them or sold them that option in exchange for the money they received has to live up to the terms of the contract. If the holder says, I'm going to exercise my put option, I'm going to sell my stock to you, or I'm going to put it to you at the price we agreed. The person who gave them that option has to buy it from them at the pre-agreed price. Again, it's a right, right? The person who owns it doesn't have to use it, but if it's profitable, he certainly will. And if it's not profitable, he certainly won't. So that's okay. That's when you, when you read questions about options, there's always two sides to it. Read the question from the point of view of whoever they're talking about in the test question. If it tells you someone buys an option or is long an option, that's one perspective, right? But the person who sold it to them has a totally different perspective. So read it from their point of view. Now, the premium, again, is the price that someone pays for the option contract. All right, buyers pay it, sellers receive it. Now, the way they give you, when they give you a price quote, right, the price they give you is always in dollars and cents on a per share basis. Every contract covers 100 shares of stock. That's an industry standard, so it's a safe assumption unless you're specifically told otherwise, and it's not at all likely you'll be told otherwise. So if I said the premium was four, that's a shorthand for $4 per share times 100 shares per contract. So it's $400. Buyer would pay $400 to lock in the price. Seller receives $400 to agree to trade with them if the buyer, option buyer 
has them to do so. That pre-agreed price is known as the strike price. Right. Or again, it's also called exercise price. I'll write that out for you here. Strike price or exercise price. Okay. So that means that's the price they locked in at. Now, again, it is standardized. It says standardized by the Options Clearing Corporation. That's the thing about options. They're known, in fact, as standardized options because they're cookie cutter in a lot of ways, standardized. So they all cover 100 shares. Right? The premium is always 100 times the price you see. Uh, they had uh, spe specified expiration dates, so that so that way everybody knows exactly what to expect. Right? They, okay, no surprises. The Options Clearing Corporation is behind the scenes. The OCC is basically where do these options come from? They're issued by the Options Clearing Corporation. That's who issues them. They also set out the uh, the options that are available to trade with different expiration months. Right, you can get them shorter term or longer term. Right, they give them what strike price is available, what price you want to lock it in at. And they also do the clearance and settlement, which means that by that means, it makes sure that the buyer gets the money and the seller gets the cash. And if someone exercises or uses their option, right, that the trade takes place between them. One side gets the securities, the other side gets the cash. Okay. Now, when we talk about options, since they're standardized, they use a specific notation, right? And this is, again, this is uniform. So you'll always see it described exactly this way. First, you'll see the number you see is the number of contracts. The number one here means one contract, and one contract is 100 shares. ABC is the ticker symbol for the underlying stock. Now, in the test you'll, or the practice question, you'll see like ABC, XYZ, um, MNO, or, <laughs> D, or, uh, or PDQ, whatever it is, right? But in reality, it might be like, you know, GM for General Motors and, um, I don't know, KO for Coca-Cola, whatever it is, right? So but the, that would be the underlying stock. The next thing you see is the month of expiration. They're only good for a limited time. So the so the next notation is when does this option expire? It's right, January, J-A-N for January, this option expires in January. When in January? More specifically, third Friday of the month. Again, standardized and uniform. Always third Friday is expiration date. And if they ever really get you into it, it expires that Friday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. <laughs> okay. I don't know if they'll ever get that precise with you, but in case they do, that's when it is. Now the 40, right, the 40, that's the strike price. That's the pre-agreed fixed price. That's the locked in price to trade at $40, no matter what the actual price is. And then it would say either a call or a put option to tell you what type it is. So one ABC January 40 call is the right to buy 100 shares of ABC stock at $40 a share until third Friday in January. The at five, that's the, that's the premium. That's the price of the option. On a, on a per share basis, $5 a share times 100 shares per contract, $500. Option buyer paid $500 to lock in the buy price at $40 until January. Option seller collected $500, who would have to then sell ABC stock to the option buyer at $40, no matter what the actual price is. Okay. Now, when you have an option contract, there's basically three things you can end up doing with them. One, you can exercise them. You, you use it like a contract. Right, exercise the option, buy or sell at the pre-agreed price, or you don't have to. You don't have to use it. You can trade it. Okay, there's a marketplace for them. There are options exchanges. They can be bought and sold. In fact, most options are never exercised. They're traded. When I buy options, I don't ever want to use it. <laughs> if I buy a call, it's not because I really want to buy 100 shares of stock from somebody. I really want to be able to sell my option for more than I paid for it. If I bought it at a premium of $3, meaning $300 for the contract, and I can sell it for $4.50 a share, right, which would be $450, hey, I'm all right with that. <laughs> I'm a pretty happy guy. Or, well, you just let it go, right? You just let it hit its expiration date and it expires. If the option is not profitable to use it by the expiration date, the option will just simply expire. It goes away, okay? At that point, it's like an old coupon. As a matter of fact, come to think of it, that's what an option is like. It's like this. This is an option contract. This is a call option. When I clip this out of paper here, I have the right to buy a 12 inch sub for $6.99. No matter what the actual price is, whatever the price it says on the menu on the wall behind me, or behind the, behind the, uh, behind the cashier, I can buy it at $6.99. Okay, 
And so if I go to the Subway store and I say, I'm going to use this for $6.99, I get to buy it. So when I present it, what does the cashier have to do? The cashier has to sell me a 12-inch sub for $6.99, no matter what the actual price is. On the other, but remember, this option has, right, there's an expiration date on that somewhere in the tiny ice tray size print on this. So once it's past this expiration date, is this any good anymore? If I present it past its expiration date, does the cashier have to sell me a sub for $6.99? No. They'd be like, sorry, sir. <laughs> Their option's expired. <laughs> okay. It's like that. Do I have to use this option? Do I, if I go to the store and I said, oh, we're having a sale today on 12-inch fubs and they're $5.99. Am I going to use my $6.99? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So I don't have to use it, but I can. And I will if it's worth my while to do so. All right, now the settlement of the trades. Now, options, again, are tradable. They can be bought. They're financial instruments, bought and sold. Now, they're tr they're, uh, the trade, they have a one business day settlement. Remember, most things are two business days, trade day plus two or T plus two. But the exceptions are government bonds and options have a one business day settlement. So today was Monday. If I bought an option today, settlement date is tomorrow. Now, if I exercise the option, that's like trading the stock itself. In that case, trading the stock is a two business day settlement like it normally is. The last day to trade an option or exercise it is the Friday, that you know, that third Friday of the month. That's the last time. But the last time to trade it is 4 p.m. Eastern time. Remember, that's when the New York Stock Exchange closes. So after that, I can't trade them anymore. And that's on expiration date. Then they're gone. Now, the last time, now, if I want to use my option, someone wants to use their option, they have, well, okay, they would notify the broker dealer firm. Call them and say, I want to use my option. Now, they have until 5.30 p.m. Eastern time on Friday, an extra 90 minutes, to send in their exercise instructions. Now, in reality, people don't have to do that. They're going to do it for them. But nevertheless, that's when the instructions have to be received, right, at the Options Clearing Corporation, who, right, who handles all the behind the scenes, matching up the buyer and the seller. Okay, so if the contract expires, well, someone paid for an option, they took a chance and it didn't work out, the option expires and the buyer lost the premium they paid for it. If they paid $300, $500 for the option, they're out that money. But on the other hand, that's their worst case scenario. The worst thing that happens to them is they're out a few hundred bucks. Okay. The buyer, however, does not have to live up to the contract, do they? Right? They present a call and they present the coupon, but they don't have to use it. <laughs> okay. And, right, and, uh, and the, uh, it's not probably use it. They're just going to lose it. And the buyer gets to keep the premium that they received. When they sell that option, that is cash in pocket. And they didn't have to live up to the contract. Option goes away. It expires. And they're still holding on to the cash. Okay. That's, of course, the, however, that's the most they can possibly make. They just keep the premium and nothing else happens. They're, they're still counting the cash. If the option is exercised, well, then the option, if the call option, right? The option buyer or holder says, I'm going to exercise my call option. I'm going to use my coupon and I'm going to buy the stock from you at the strike price. Therefore, the person who sold them that option has to sell it to them at the strike price. Question says, wait, the buyer loses the premium of the account paid? Yes, right. If they paid for this option, whatever it is, if it didn't work out, the, right, they lose that money. It goes away. They're out that money. Okay. But that, of course, again, that's their worst case scenario. Took a chance and it didn't work out. The person who sold the put option, giving someone else the right to sell their stock to them. And if the option is exercised, it says, I'm going to use my put option, I'm going to sell the stock to you, I'll put it to you at the price we agreed. They're obvious a contract. They have to buy from them at the pre-agreed price. Okay, now you can also trade the option. If you buy an option, you can sell it. But the option seller doesn't have to actually keep the option open, right, and have that liability they could get out of or under that liability by buying the option back again. So an opening purchase, closing sale. If I bought the option, I can sell it, and hopefully I can sell it for more than I paid for it and keep a profit. The person who sold an option can get out from it. They don't have to wait until it expires. They can get out from under that obligation by buying the option back again, and now they no longer have this outstanding liability. They don't have to live up to the contract. It's they've closed it out. And again, if they can buy it back for <laughs> Less than what they got for it when they sold it, they get to keep the difference as profit. Okay, so opening purchase, that's to buy to open, okay, which is a long or an ownership position. 
if you sell to open or an opening sale, that's a short position. You now owe something. Okay. How do you get out from an opening purchase? Right. You sell it again, right? You bought it, you sell it. Okay. And that's an opening purchase followed by a closing sale. And if you sold something and to get out from under that obligation, you can buy it back again, hopefully at a lower price. And that's a closing purchase. Opening purchase, closing sale. Buy to open, sell to close. Opening sale, closing purchase, or sell to open, buy to close. Okay. The pricing of options. So let's talk about the option pricing. The, uh, the price you pay for an option is called a premium. Right. To figure out what the premium is, what goes into that, uh, there's two basic values to it. There's the intrinsic value and the time value. Intrinsic value means like it has built-in value to it, built-in profitability to it. That's intrinsic means it's part of it, which means that if possible, it would be profitable to use that option. To figure out if the option has intrinsic value, just to look at two things. Compare the strike price of the option against the market price of the stock. And from those two numbers only, determine would it be profitable to use that option or not. If that option is profitable, then we say this option has intrinsic value, right? Built-in profitability to it. We'd also say the option is in the money. Right? If, it's, if it's properly used, it, it's in the money. So notice this, right? If the option is in the money, it has intrinsic value. Yes, Jason. Was that the, kind of like that example you gave last week uh, about Nike, Nike shoes or something? Tell you that, I don't remember what the example like, like was. Intrinsic value, uh, Nike or, or, or time value. Uh... Well, we, okay, there is t intrinsic and time value. Yeah. Okay. Now time value, Okay, is well, that's the value of the option based on how much time remains until the option expires. Buying an option is buying time because right. they all have an expiration date. Now, of course, the more time it has, well, then it has the more chance to go in the money, right? To become right, increasingly valuable, become profitable. If it's only got a little bit of time left, right, then it's not much time. So there's not much time value. And that's the thing about an option and about the option time value. Options are a wasting asset which means as time goes by, the time value decreases or decays until it gets to the expiration date. On the sort of, I'm sorry? Intrinsic value. Yes, intrinsic value is built in profitability. Compare strike price to market price and only use those two numbers to determine intrinsic value. Anything but if the premium, anything over that premium over above that intrinsic value, anything left is time value and that's how much time is remaining so the premium there right, is the intrinsic value intrinsic value plus time value is the premium right. now you can figure out the intrinsic value if you compare the strike price versus the actual price because then what then therefore the time value must be the premium right take out the intrinsic value whatever's left over is time value and time value will eventually run down to zero. On the option's expiration date, there's no time left, therefore there's no time value. Question here says, can I explain exercising an option? That's, I go to Subway and I buy a sub for $6.99. <laughs> That's what it means. So I, if I have a call option, I have, a, let's say, a, what did we see before? One, A, B, one, one, A, A B C, January, 40 call. That's so, so the person who owns it, if I bought this, I have the right to buy, calls right to buy, one contract for 100 shares of ABC stock at $40 until January. So if ABC is above $40 when January comes around, well, if I have the chance to buy something for $40, that's worth, say, $45, would I do that? Would you buy something for $40 that's worth $45? I sure hope you said yes, right? Okay, any more than I would buy a, a sub for six ninety nine if it's worth eight ninety nine. <laughs> so I would exercise the option to to call the stock to me and buy it for forty dollars. So now I, I now own a hundred hundred shares of ABC stock at forty dollars a share, and if it's actually worth forty five, hey, I've just made an instant profit, haven't I? In fact, how much profit would I make? Five dollars a share. So that's its built-in profitability, right? If I have the right to buy it at 40 and it's worth 45, that's $5 a share intrinsic value, right? And it's in the money by $5. My pleasure, Karina.
Okay, notice also it says determine if the option is in or out of the money has nothing to do with the premium that was paid. Again, in the money or out of the money. Only compare strike price to market price. In fact, what they call the moneyness of options, whether it's in the money, out of the money, or at the money, it's, a, it's an adjective that describes the option itself. Right, so it's, it's just, it in and of itself, in the money or out, does not necessarily mean someone has a profit or a loss. Right, in and of itself. Notice, for example, I only compared strike price to market price, and I did not factor in the premium. Now, that's important to figure out if someone ends up with a profit or loss, right? How much do they pay for the investments? But it's not, but in around the money, just market price to strike price, and it just describes the option. Okay. Now, a call option, of course, would be in the money. It would be profitable if the actual price was greater than the strike price. I can buy it for 40, and it's worth 45. That option is in the money by five points or $5 in the money and has $5 of intrinsic value. Put options, however, they're about because they lock in the sell price to be able to sell the stock no matter what the actual price is. So that option is in the money if the actual price is less than the strike price. So if I own, if I own one ABC January 40 put, I have the right to sell 100 shares of ABC stock at $40 a share until January. And if January comes around and ABC stock is $35, well, if I had the chance to get something for $35 and I have a contract that says I can sell it at $40, am I going to do that? Would I buy get something for $35 that I can sell for $40? I sure hope you said yes. Absolutely would. Because that option would be profitable and make $5 profit. Therefore, it's in the money by $5 and it's $5 intrinsic value. So if ABC is $35. I can acquire something, I can acquire it for $35, turn around and sell it for $40. That's $5 of intrinsic value and is in the money by $5. However, if I have the ABC January 40 put and ABC is $45. Now, can I make a profit acquiring something for $45 that I can sell at $40? It's pretty hard to make a profit that way, isn't it? So as there's no built-in profit, therefore, this option has no intrinsic value and is out of the money by $5. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, I hope they have this. They might have some. Okay, yeah, good. I was hoping they'd have some practice questions. The ABC January 50, 50 call. I have the right to, the holder has the right to buy ABC stock at $50 up until January. If ABC is $55, can you make a profit buying something for $50 that's worth $55? Sure can. It's in the money, right? It's $5 intrinsic value or built-in profit, and it's in the money by $5. Question says, uh, uh, in the money doesn't necessarily mean profitable. In and of itself, it does not. Not in and of itself. It's an adjective that describes the option. That's what we have to know. Okay. All right. Just to give you a quick example of that here, what if I bought this option? to buy ABC stock for $50 a share, but I paid $6 a share for it. And I just made $5 profit. Does that really sound like I came out ahead if I spent $6 and made $5? Doesn't really sound like a profit, does it? <laughs> so that's why just just only compare strike to market price. Good, good, all right, here, that makes sense. All right, if, uh, now let's look at this one down here, right? If ABC is $45 and, right, and I have the right to buy it at $50, I can make a profit buying something for $50, that's worth $45. That option's out of the money by $5. It's not profitable, so it has no intrinsic value. All right, by the way, intrinsic value is always zero or a positive number. There is no negative intrinsic value. It's just out of the money, has no built-in profit to it. Now, what if I have the ABC January 50 call and ABC is exactly to the penny $50? <laughs> well, that option, we say the option is at the money. But can I make a profit buying something for $50 that's worth $50? Still hard to make a profit doing that. It still has no intrinsic value. Options have to be in the money, have to be in the money to have intrinsic value. If the option is in the money by the expiration date, the option holder is going to exercise the option. Okay, they'll use the option. If it's out of the money by the expiration date, that means it's not properly use it. If they don't use it, they lose it. That's right. It all has an expiration date on there. <laughs> okay. And if they don't use it, they lose it. Premium that they paid for, it's gone. But that's their worst case scenario. If it's a put option, 
one ABC January 50 put. The holder has the right, not an obligation, to sell 100 shares of ABC stock at $50 a share, no matter what the actual price is, up until January, third Friday in January. Now, if, third, if on the third Friday in January, ABC is $45, now can I make a profit if I get ABC at market price of 45, then use my put option to put it to somebody else at $50. Okay. I'd make a profit that way. How much profit? $5. This contract is in the money by $5, and that's $5 of intrinsic value, built-in profitability to it. If ABC, however, I have a right to sell it at 50, and ABC is actually 55, I can't make a profit getting something for 55, then selling it for 50. The option is out of the money, has no intrinsic value, no built-in profit to me, and it's out of the money by $5. And again, of course, if it's actually exactly $5 to the penny, the option is at the money. Okay. Question says, how much are these options premiums typically? The, the premium? The premium, okay. Um, there might be a slide about it, but uh, let's just come down to it. When it comes down to the premium, first off, is there any intrinsic value? Is there any built-in profitability to it? All right, that would come up to the premium. Then the next part is the time value. The time value is how much time remaining. Now, the more time the option has, the more it's worth. Right? If I have a nine-month option, yes, that's worth a lot more than a two-month option. If it expires in two months. Yes, so the time value, so the longer the time there is, the more the time value it is. But time value decays. It goes down. In fact, it doesn't go down evenly like, like either, by the way. Um, let me see, let me try to draw this for you here. Not like that. Sorry, wrong one. I want the free form. Here we go. See, it doesn't just go down like from here down to here, right? It doesn't go down straight line. Oops, I drew an arc, not, not a straight. Sorry about that. Let me try again. No, oh, this is the one. Swiggles. Okay. It doesn't go down straight line like this from what it is down to zero. Instead, it goes more like this. The option premium is kind of, the decay is kind of slow. And then when it gets close to expiration, it kind of nosedives down there. Okay. So how much, is it, now the next thing about it, I don't know if they'll mention this on the slide or even this, but the biggest practice part of it is the underlying volatility of the, of the stock, the, the volatility underlying stock, how big the up and down price swings are. That's, a, that's probably the biggest factor, okay? The more up and down price swings, the more the premium is. Because after all, if it swings up and down a lot, it's more likely that I'll go in the money by the time it expires. So therefore, it's got, okay, you know, it's got more likely, so it's worth more to, to pay it. Also, the person who sold that option is going to want more money too, because, you know, they're kind of taking greater risk as a result. Okay, so let's check this out. We're going to buy ABC or the sell, right? The January 50 call at seven, seven dollars a share times 100 is 700 dollars. ABC is actually 55. So this option is has built-in profitability of $5 to it, right? Buy it for 50, it's worth 55. So why does it cost $7? What's the other $2? That other $2 is the time value. The remaining time until the option expires, which again will dwindle down to zero on the expiration date. And we have the ABC January 50 put at seven, and ABC is 45. This option is in the money, right? You can, it's worth 45, but you can sell it for 50. That's $5 of built-in profit, $5 of intrinsic value, but it costs $7. The other $2 is time value. All right, before we go on to talk about how, how we might use options, uh, let's, I think it's a good time to take a quick break. <laughs> so I think, we, I think we definitely need one. So let's go ahead and break right now and return at uh 34 past the hour whatever the hour is in your okay and then uh, as always if we are on a break if you have a question if you want me to go back to another slide uh please unmute and ask a question or make your request or type it into the chat and i'll reply accordingly and all that i'll see you in a few minutes okay so welcome back and i'm already seeing some thumbs up here so thank you very much for your feedback to help me know things are working right okay all right awesome Okay, thanks, Amy. All right, so now that we know something about options, now we say, well, what do you do with them? Well, one of the things you can do, thanks, Jason, 
is a speculative strategy, speculation. Now, speculation is a polite way of saying gambling. But that's why they can use options is basically making a bet as to the direction of the underlying stock. Let's put it this way. If someone thinks the stock is going to go up, do you think they would want to buy it now or sell it now? If they think the stock is going to go up, I think they'd want, yes, yes, agree. they'd want to buy it now. Now, they could buy 100 shares of stock, but they but that would cost thousands of dollars. And that's thousands of dollars tied up in at risk. Or for a few hundred dollars, they can buy a call option, which gives them the right to buy the stock at a fixed pre-agreed price. Okay. But next, but then they're only spending a few hundred dollars, not a few thousand. So they're risking hundreds, not thousands. That's why people bet options, leverage, massive leverage, right? For a few hundred dollars, they can control thousands of dollars worth of stock for at least a period of time. On the other hand, if someone is bearish on a stock, they think it's going to go down. Well, if they think it's going to go down, would they want to buy it now or sell it now? Yeah, right, Karina. Exactly. They'd want to sell it, wouldn't they? Or sell it short. But instead of that, what if they also just purchased a put option that gives them the right to sell the stock at a fixed price, no matter what the actual price is, and instead of risking right, risking hundreds, not thousands. So that's why we can way we can use options. Okay. So strategy. So with the strategies, we can take advantage of leverage by buying options. Of course, if someone buys something, someone else will sell it to them, and they can get collect they can collect that premium and collect income from it. So if they're bullish on the stock, they would buy a call option, the right to buy the stock at a fixed price. So they would have no position XYZ, but they could buy the XYZ call, read long the call option. If someone is bearish on a stock and expects it to go down, they can buy put options to lock in their sell price now, fearing that the stock will go down later, they can buy it when it's cheaper, then use their put option, exercise and put the stock to someone else at the strike price and make a profit that way. See, that's how you can profit if the stock goes down buying it cheaper and to sell it someone else at a fixed price. So they would be long or own the XYZ put. Remember, uh, use these options are interchangeable. Okay, we're gonna say the buyer, a holder, or long, all mean the same thing. Now on the other side of the deal is the option seller, right? Now they could sell a call, right? If they think the stock's, that they think the stock's gonna go up, well, they could sell the stock to someone, sell, right? so sell someone else a call option. Right? And they can receive that premium. So they would be short that call option. Of course, someone else could also, they could sell put options too. So there's going to be someone who is the seller, who's also called the writer, who would be short of the option. Okay, remember, all those words are interchangeable. Okay, so let's take it from the example here. Now, this is a this is like a summary of these of the strategies here. And I would suggest when you when you get your scratch paper or your marker boards at the you know for your dump sheet draw like this two by two grid right so basically you're making this four quadrants right? you know, so you have calls and puts in the rows and buys and sells in the col in the columns so just remember two things when you just draw this on your scratch paper remember two things in the upper left corner buy calls is bullish draw an up arrow and then everything else is opposite if buy calls is bullish, draw an up arrow, then sell calls must be bearish, draw a down arrow. If buy calls is bullish, then buy puts must be bearish, draw a down arrow. And if buy puts is bearish, then sell puts must be bullish, draw an up arrow. Okay, so just remember the two things, upper left corner, buy calls is bullish, the rest of the chart fills in itself. Okay. They says also talk about what's the maximum possible gain, what's the maximum possible loss, and what's the break-even point? BE means break-even, where the price with the underlying stock would be really showed no zero gain, zero loss, just absolutely break-even, zero. Okay. There's a couple things to look out for. First off, notice this. The maximum gain of a call option, the right to buy it, is conceivably unlimited because when someone buys a call option, they have the right to buy the stock at a fixed price, and then they, if the price goes up, they can buy at the fixed price and turn around and sell at the higher price. Now, the higher it goes, the more money they make, or more profit they can make. Is there a limit? Is there a ceiling? How high a price of a stock can go? There's no limit. There's no ceiling. So that's why buying calls conceivably is unlimited possible gain. 
Now, the maximum possible loss, as always for an option buyer, is the premium they paid. They bought to buy the stock at a certain price. It never got above that price, and they're out the premium they paid for it. But that's the worst case scenario. But before you can show a profit, you have to cover all your expenses. So the break-even point is the strike price, right? The what the price they can buy for, plus the premium they paid for the option. You have to add all your costs together before you can show a profit. So add the two numbers together, and that's the break-even point. So if the stock is trading at that exact price, they would show zero gain or loss, break-even. Once it goes above the break-even point, they start to win. They start to make a profit. But if they are, but but the option seller, however, they basically are saying that well, why did somebody sell a call option? The person who buys it thinks it's going to go up. They think it's going to be above the strike price by the time the option expires. And the person who sold it to them says, no way. They think they have the opposite opinion. They think the stock will go, go, go down or at least stay the same. And it's going to be below the strike price because if you have the right to buy it for $40 and the actual price is $35, is the option holder going to exercise the option? Would you buy something for $35 that's worth $40? i am sorry, I got, that, I got that wrong. Would you buy something for $40 that's worth $35? I don't think so. <laughs> don't think you'd be too enthusiastic. Yeah, right, great. You say no to that. So therefore, they're not going to use the option. It's not profitable. If they don't use it, they lose it. The option seller, however, who collected that premium, right? they didn't have to live up to the contract. No one's going to come back to them and say, I'm going to buy this stock from you at $40 if it's worth $35. The option expires, and they no longer have this obligation. It's gone. But they're still holding on to the cash. They get to keep the premium, so but that's their maximum possible gain. Now their loss, however, well, they agree to sell the stock at forty dollars, and if it goes above forty dollars, the holder's going to say, "I'm going to buy it from you at forty. So therefore, if they agree to sell it to them at forty dollars, but they don't have the stock, well, they got to go get it. They got to go buy it and buy it whatever the price is. And if that price keeps going up, they're going to end up losing more money. Right, well, they have to they have they have to sell it to them at forty, and it's worth forty five. They got to go buy it at forty five dollars just to sell it to somebody at forty. Well, what if it was fifty dollars? They'd have to buy it at fifty dollars to sell it to someone at forty. What if it was sixty or eighty or a hundred or five? Doesn't matter, does it? They got to go buy it, whatever it is. The higher it goes, the more money they lose because they have to pay higher prices, and there's no ceiling how high a price for stock can go. So their maximum loss is conceivably unlimited. Exactly, Corinna, conceivably unlimited loss. Notice that the buyer's maximum gain and the seller's maximum loss are the same. And the buyer's maximum loss and the seller's maximum gain are the same. And they also both have the same break-even point, the strike price plus the premium. Once it goes above the break-even point, the option buyer starts to win, the option seller starts to lose. Think of it this way. These are two, they're making a bet. It is a wager. I said speculation sounds as a polite way of saying gambling. They're making a wager where the stock's going to go. And the way it works out, it's a zero-sum game. Whatever one side wins, the other side loses. Put options. Okay. The right to sell the stock. So if someone gets that when they're bearish, they think the stock's going to go down. If they were right, they can buy it later when it's cheaper. Then exercise their put option and sell the stock to someone else at the pre pricked price and make a profit that way. But, okay, but first off, how much can they maximum gain? Now, the lower the stock goes, the more money they make because they can buy it cheaper and cheaper and sell it at a fixed price. Well, is there a limit to how low a price of a stock can go? Yeah, there's a limit. <laughs> Can't go below zero. So if it does, right, if the stock's worthless and the company's bankrupt, they can buy the stock for nothing, sell the stock to someone at the strike price or the fixed price and make a profit that way. Now, again, before they can make a profit, got to cover your costs and that includes the cost that they paid for the option so it's got to go down but it's got to go down by enough to cover the cost to cover that premium the maximum loss as always for an option buyer is the premium that they paid they thought it would go down and it didn't so therefore they they're out the money they paid for it but again that's their worst case scenario and of course if someone sells a put option if someone buys a put option someone else has to sell it to them the option seller has the opposite opinion. The person who buys the put thinks it's going to go down below the strike price, and the person who sells it to them says, no way. That's why they're happy to take their money, because they fear they're not going to use that put option. No one's going to sell something for $40 that's worth $45. And the option will expire, 
they get to keep the cash without having to do anything. But it could happen. Someone will sell, they could sell that out. Someone will say, I'm going to use my put option and sell the stock to you. And so have to, they have to buy from them at the pre-agreed price, let's say $40. Now that they bought it, they probably don't really want it. <laughs> and it's gone down to $35 now. Well, they'll have to buy it at 40 and then they can just sell it. They'd, have, they'd get rid of it at 35 and they'd lose money that way. Now, of course, once they, but it's got to go below the break-even point. Once it goes below the break-even point, option, put option buyer starts to win, put option seller starts to lose. BE stands for break-even. Question says, to order to have a put, do you have to have a call first? No, they are separate things. These are separate instruments. You do not have to have them together. Okay. All right, what I'm going to do now is, um, okay, uh, let's see. The way they do it, this is called the T-chart. Okay. This is, this is, this is going to be your, your, your Jedi mind games right here, okay? This is, okay, this is your ninja, your, your ninja tool right here. They're called T-charts. If you've ever taken any, um, uh, like, basic accounting classes, this would probably look familiar to you. So they, the way they do it, they put the option on one side and the stock on the other. I'm going to do it the way I was told to do it. I think it's easier and makes more sense this way. Um, you basically make a T chart, which making you're you're making two columns. On the left side, it's actually, it's called debit register, but let's just make it. We're not here to become accountants. Let's call it money out. And on the right side, that's formally called your credit register. But let's make it simple. Let's just call that money in. In. So when it gives you a test question. You go through the steps question, and every time it says someone buys something, you make a note of it, and you put it on the money out column with the price per share. Every time it tells you someone sells something, make a note of that, write it down, use your scratch paper or the, or the dry erase board they give you, and make a note with the price per share, put that on the money in column. Then what you do to figure out the answers, you write, add up all the whatever's going out compared to whatever's coming in, and then figure out line, bottom line, gain or loss, or, okay, or max gain, loss, or break even. Okay, so here we go. Let's go ahead and do this. A customer buys one ABC January 30 call at four when ABC is $29. ABC goes to $47 and the customer exercises the call. What is the maximum possible gain, maximum loss, break even, or in a scenario did someone end up a profit? By the way, as I figure it, there are five types of questions that they can ask you about options. The question is either definition or strategy, which means what is or what would you do with? Or, What's the maximum possible gain, or what's the maximum possible loss, or what's the break-even point where there's zero gain or, or zero loss, or in a scenario, did someone end up with a profit or loss, and how much was it? That, that's five types of questions, and everything else is fill in the blanks. We're going to fill in the blanks and work it out. Okay. First one. Okay, so what's the maximum? Okay, so first off, so a customer buys an ABC January call at four. So I'm going to put that here on the money out column. Uh, let me see. Okay, well, the money I'll call. Now, in the textbooks, they'll just have you write something like, you know, four. They bought it for four dollars. And when I was taking my test, if I found, if if I just wrote down the price per share like they showed you in the textbook, sometimes I forgot what the number referred to. So now I make little notes. <laughs> so I'm going to give a little notes about it. Okay, I'm just going to say a uh, customer buys the January call, so I'm going to buy a call, and I'm going to put a minus four. And I do that to make it more visually clear. That is money flowing out. Okay. ABC goes to 47 and the customer exercises the call. First off, what is the maximum possible gain? So, first thing, they bought the call for $4. So, that's their first expense. Let's assume that the call is in the money on expiration date. This means it's profitable to use it. If it's profitable to use it, they're going to exercise the call. So, we're going to buy ABC stock at what price? Can you tell me what price will we, if we exercise the call? We buy ABC stock at what price? No, not four. Four dollars is what the, is the premium. That's what they paid for the option to lock in the price. Four hundred. Well, that would be the total cost to for for right for the option. Four hundred dollars. No, not twenty nine dollars. It was $29 when the customer bought the call option. 
There you go, Ashley, Alexis. We have the right to buy the stock, the ABC January 30 call. The right to buy 100 shares of ABC at $30. So let's go ahead and assume that they're going to exercise the call option and buy ABC at the strike price of $30. Again, I put a minus sign in front of it just to be more visually clear. So, so far, they spent $34 a share. At this moment, they're out of pocket $34. Okay. Having just spent a total of $34, see, now that they bought ABC stock, sooner or later, they're going to want to sell ABC stock, right? So, what price would they have to pay, sell ABC stock for just to break even, just to show zero gain or loss? So far, they spent a total of $34, right? How much will they have to sell 84, 34 ABC stock for to break even? 47? Now, if they sell it for 47, they're going to do more than break even. Even 30, 34. Yes. If they sell ABC stock for exactly $34 right now, what would it look like? Right. So far, like a right, 30, 34 went out and 34 went in. For a grand total, let me see if let me do this. For a grand total, uh, I was hoping I was going to do this, but a grand total of zero. Zero. How did I get 34? How much they spent $4 for the option and $30 for the stock itself. How much money have they spent per share so far? How much are they out of pocket? Right between those two things, they spent $34, haven't they? So therefore, since they're $34 out of pocket, if they sell it for exactly 34, they'd 100% break even at 34. So their break even point, here, right here, is 34. Okay. What's the maximum possible gain? Now, once ABC stock goes above the break even point, above $34, they're going to start to show a profit. How much profit could they possibly potentially make? Is there a limit? Is there a cap? Is there a ceiling? Oh, it can go above 30. You could go above 47. Right. There is no limit. So that's why conceivably, at least in theory, they could sell it for an unlimited amount. So therefore, if $34 went out and infinity comes in, what's their grand, what's their grand total now? Plus how much? Mm-hmm. 34 goes out and infin unlimited comes in. Oh, somebody must be able to say it, right? Unmute or type in a message. No, not minus 34. Not zero. 34 goes out and infinity comes in. Unlimited. You got it, Hannah. Their total is unlimited. That is their maximum possible gain for owning a call option. Now, of course, in reality, it's never going to go up an actual unlimited amount. Okay, but conceivably it could, and therefore that's the right answer for the test. <laughs> What's the maximum possible loss on this transaction? Well, what happens if... Um, if the call option is out of the money on expiration date. Is someone going to exercise the call option? They bought the call for $4. If ABC is anything under $30, if it's $29, if it's less than $30, are they going to exercise the call option? Is someone going to buy something for $30 if it's worth $29? No, of course not, Alexa. Exactly. No, they won't use it. So that's it. They bought the call option, and that's it. Nothing else happened, and the option ex the option just expires. So, total of four dollars went up. So, uh, if right, four dollars went out, and nothing came in. Now, what's their grand total? Now, their grand total is minus four dollars a share times a hundred shares per contract equals minus four hundred dollars. So, their max loss is. 400. 
All right, now the, now in the last one, the market goes to $47. Okay. Uh, is this person, are they going to exercise the call option? Is this option in the money or out of the money? Right to buy it at 30 and it's worth 47. In the money or out of the money? In the money, right, Karina? Right, Ashley? Right, Amy? Good. In the money by how much? Seventeen, right? Seventeen points in the money, perfect, right? That's pretty far, and that's pretty deep in the money. <laughs> okay, so absolutely. So it's got seventeen dollars of intrinsic value. So you're gonna buy. So so you're gonna exercise the option. Absolutely will. So we're gonna buy ABC stock again, at and we're gonna pay it for the strike price of thirty dollars. Now that we bought it, well, we're gonna sell it now. We're gonna sell ABC stock. What price are we gonna sell it for? 47. We're going to sell it for 47. So how are we doing bottom line now? So looking at this, okay, it was a $34 went out and $47 came in. What is our grand total bottom line now? Not quite 17, I think. 13, yes. 34 went out, 47 came in, plus 13, $13 a share times 100 shares per contract equals plus $1,300. That is the transaction. So we just went through the, right, when buying a call option, we went through the four possible questions here that we can answer with our charts. Maximum gain, maximum loss, break-even point where there's no gain or loss, and a profit or loss scenario. Where did the 13 come from? Because $34 went out and $47 came in, plus 13. Do you see that? All right. Now, thumbs up. Nice. Okay, good. Now, let's check out this one. The short call strategy. Short call. Now, again, there's, okay, if you notice, they use the option on one side and stock on the other side. Any system, you, as long as it works, it works. I'm going to tell you the one I prefer to use, all right, because I, that's what I was trained on, so that's the one I'm using. And I suggest this, right? It's a training for you. Whatever system you use, stick with it. Just pick a system, stick with it. When you get to, to, to the testing center, just do it like you rehearsed it. <laughs> okay, question here says, when the stock goes infinity unlimited, is this when an owner should anticipate a higher price to sell the stock at? In this case, remember, this is a theoretical kind of thing, right? It's theoretically unlimited gain because they can buy it at a fixed price, and once it goes up above the break-even point, they're going to start making money. How much money could they possibly make? Theoretically unlimited. That's that's just it. It's just a theoretical point. Okay. All right, let's check this out. A customer sells one ABC January 30 call at four when ABC is 29. ABC goes to $47 and the customer is exercised. Actually, the terms, the terminology they use, by the way. Okay. Option buyer or the holder, right? Exercises the option. The option seller or the option writer is assigned. That's the terminology. That's the one they use. Okay. By the way, if the option is in the money on expiration date, the holder will exercise the option, right, for whatever intrinsic value there is. Now, remember, it's got to be above the break-even point before they can show a profit. If it's not, they'll still, they'll still exercise it. But in this case, they're cutting their losses rather than making a profit. Okay. The writer would be assigned the contract. Okay, so if the option is in the money on expiration date, option buyer wins the bet, option seller loses the bet. However, if the option is out of the money on expiration date, the holder will not exercise the option because it's not properly use it. The option holder loses the bet, and the option writer wins the bet. <laughs> That's what they're looking for, okay? Right, That's who wins, who loses. So option holder wants it to be in the money. Option seller wants to be out of the money. Okay, so let's check this out. 
So the customer sells one ABC January 30 call at four. So the first thing we'll put this in, right? They're selling something, an opening sale. So we're going to put that in our money in column. We're going to sell the call for plus four. Okay, and then ABC goes to 47. The customer is exercised or assigned. What is the max gain loss break even? Okay, so let's assume that he sold the call option and the holder says, I'm going to use my call option to buy the stock from you with, with the price we agreed. So they're going to be obligated to do what? I'm going to buy it from you. So they'll have to sell ABC stock to them at $30 a share. So let's go ahead and assume that happens. We're going to sell ABC stock now, ABC, for how much? At the strike price, the pre-agreed price at $30. At this moment, how much are they up right now? How much are they in pocket at this moment between having sold these two things? So far, they're up by $34 a share. Right, Hannah, Alexis, exactly, good. So now that they just sold ABC stock to somebody, if they don't have it, they have to go get it. And they got to go pay the price for it. Now, what price would they have to pay for ABC stock right now, right, just to break even at this point, just to show zero gain or loss? They have to buy ABC stock at what price? More than $4. If they went out and they bought it for exactly $34 right now, then a total of 34 went out and a total of 34 came in for a grand total of zero. So their break even point, zero gain, zero loss would be $34. Once it goes above the break-even point, they're going to start to lose money because now they have to go out and buy ABC stock for higher and higher prices. Right? So they're going to start losing money at that point. So, but how, right? But how much money could they possibly make or lose on this? Well, first off, what's the maximum gain? All right, maximum gain is, well, ABC stock remains below thirty dollars in January. Are they going to have to live up to the contract? Is the holder going to say, I'm going to use my call option and buy it from free with $30 if it's worth $28 or anything less than $30? I severely doubt it. <laughs> it's not properly use it. It's out of the money and the option will expire, which is exactly what the option seller hoped would happen because now they get to keep the $4 a share and not have to do anything. Easy money, right? <laughs> okay, so they're plus four on this side. Nothing went out. So they made so what's their grand total now? Oops. Grand total is come on now, please cooperate. Here we go. For a total of plus four dollars a share times a hundred shares equals plus four hundred dollars. Made four hundred bucks and didn't have to do anything. Talk about easy money, right? Okay, but as we'll see right now, this can be a hard way to make easy money. Because what is their maximum possible loss on this trade? All right, so they sold the call option for $4. Let's assume they're assigned the contract and have to live up to the terms of the contract. And they're going to sell their ABC stock, ABC stock to the option buyer at the pre-agreed price of $30. But if they don't have ABC stock, they got to go get ABC stock. So they got to go buy ABC stock now or whatever the price is. And I mean, whatever. Once it goes above $34, they're going to start to lose money. What went to $35? Well, they've just lost a dollar, haven't they? What if it went to 36 or 37 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 or 1,000 or $1 million? Doesn't matter, does it? There's no limit to how high the price can go. So they might have to pay an unlimited amount for it. Well, what's, uh, what's their bottom line total now? If infinity goes out and $34 comes in, what's their maximum possible loss? There, thanks, Alexis. Unlimited. Unlimited, you got it, Jason, exactly. Their maximum loss is theoretically unlimited. So talk about, right, I said it's not going to be a hard way to make easy money. That's why. 
All right, now let's say in the scenario, profit or loss scenario, uh, ABC goes to 47 in the customer's exercise, so they'll have to sell ABC stock at the pre-agreed price of 30. They don't have ABC stock, so they got to go get it and pay $47. That's the current market price. A total of $47 went out, and a total of $34 came in. What is their grand total bottom line? Win, lose, or draw? And how much? Minus 13, isn't it? 47 went out, 34 came in. The grand total, total, minus $13 a share times 100 shares per contract is minus $1,300. All right. We're going to make an observation right now. Okay, they're getting lost, minus $1,300. Here's the thing. This was the exact same scenario as the other one, except this one was from the option buyer side, was option buyer side, and this one's from the option seller side. So if you take a look, you see that their, their uh, T-charts are mirror images. And that's why I say it's a zero-sum game. In this scenario, the option buyer made $1,300, and the option seller lost $1,300. One side wins, the other side loses. Like I said, they're making a wager. It's a bet. Hmm. All right. How are you feeling about this so far? How you, are you, this is, is this working out for you? Is there any part that's not totally, totally clear just yet? Thank you, Alexis. If you have a concern, please ask, okay? Okay, so again, mirror images, right? All right, by the way, take a look. Okay, now this is, again, this is just me, okay? When I do these T-charts, if you notice, I also put them basically here in rows, right? Or like, in, you know, I show them like in columns here, step by step, right? So I, come, so I give some line space here. And I do that again, it makes it more visually clear the sequence of events. You know, they don't do that in the textbook. I, I do it. This is just me, but I find it just a little bit more helpful. Right? It helps, helps. That's the thing about these charts, right? When you write them down step by step by like that, it'll help you stay focused, keep you from getting all lost in the detail or lost in the weeds here. By the way, notice that this, the, both of them says they sold this call here when ABC was $29. Did that little fact have anything to do with the answers to our questions? Did it make a difference at all? Not in the bit, not even a little, did it? So every time it says when the stock was $29, this ends up being irrelevant detail. And I think they throw that in there as a distraction. Okay, expect them to do that, right? They're really testing to see if you know your stuff. And if you know your stuff, you'd know that was not a relevant detail. Let's do now this, let's do this with now with put options. Okay. So in this case, put options, right? The bearish strategy, because you think the stock's going to go down. That's why they want to lock. That's why they want to put a put option. They want to lock in their sell price now, because they figure the stock is going to go down later. Okay, so we're going to put our money out column, and we're going to put our money in column. A customer buys one ABC January 30 put at four dollars when ABC is 31. ABC goes to 14 and the customer exercises the put. Now, remember, from the put holders' of a point of view, if ABC went to $14 and dropped that far, is that a good thing or a bad thing from the put option buyer's point of view? Oh, can you see slide 209 here? All right, 209. Here we go. Okay. Do you need to take a screenshot or okay, grab that with your camera, I think? Okay. So, is uh, if the stock went down, from the put option buyer's point of view, good or bad? Okay, someone said bad and someone said good. <laughs> okay, from this person's perspective, that's good. Because they thought ABC was going to go down. They're bearish on it. That's why they bought the put option to lock in their sell price. They figured the stock goes down, they could buy it cheaper and put it to somebody else. Okay. Okay. Yeah. From their point of view. So let's take this out. So first off, the thing they did was to buy the put option. And since the first thing they did was to buy something, we're going to make a note of that on the money out column. 
Okay, so we're going to buy the put, and we paid four dollars minus four. Okay, now let's now ABC goes to fourteen, and the customer exercises the put. That means they have the right to do what? What are they going to do now by exercising the put option? What what do we put on the chart now? Put option means they have the right to sell, right to sell. So if we're going to sell something, we're going to put that on the money in column. What are we selling? Selling what? I didn't say for how much. I said, what are we selling, right? Right, now I said, we're selling shares of ABC. Now, what price are we selling it for? Well, Karina, I think you already answered that question, Karina, right? They were going to sell it for $30 because, right, we sell it at the strike price of $30. All right, so how, what's our, what's our, what's this position so far? If $4 went out and $30 came in, how much is this person in pocket right now? How much are they up right now at this point? 26, right? They're up by 26. Now that they just sold ABC stock, it's probably a good idea if they buy ABC stock. <laughs> so let's go ahead and buy ABC. But considering that they're up by 26, like right, $26 right now, how much would they have to buy ABC stock for just to break even? 26. <laughs> if they bought it for exactly 26, then a total of 30 went out and a total of 30 came in for a bottom line grand total of zero. Now, notice that, right? They have the right to sell it at 30, but before they can show a profit, it's got to go down four points because they've got to cover the cost of what they paid for the privilege of locking in their price. So it's got to go down four points before they can just to, just to break even. But they will break even at $30. I'm sorry, not $30, at $26, $26, sorry. What's the maximum possible gain in this transaction? Well, once it goes below the break-even point, right, if it goes down to $25, they're going to start making money on this because they can buy it cheaper now. If it keeps going down and down, they're going to make more and more money by buying it cheaper. How far can the price of ABC stock go down? Down to what? Right, Alexis. <laughs> A letter O or number zero? <laughs> yeah, right. It could go down to zero. ABC company is bankrupt, out of business, and the stock is worthless. So they can quote unquote buy it for nothing, exercise the put option for sell it for $30. But they did have to pay $4 a share for the privilege of locking the price. So if $4 went out and 30 came in, what's the grand total? Yep, you got it. Plus $26 a share times 100 shares per contract equals plus uh, plus $2,600. Okay, so that's their maximum possible gain. Long calls, buying the call has unlimited potential gain, at least in theory anyway. Okay, but their stock goes to zero. So this for this person, right? is the best case scenario. I know that's a worst case scenario for, other, for a lot of other people, but for them it's their best case scenario. What is the maximum loss on this transaction? Well, as always for an option buyer, the maximum loss is the premium they paid. Because if they have the right to, buy, to sell ABC stock at $30, and when January comes around and ABC stock is $32, are they gonna wanna sell something for $30 that's worth 32? I kind of doubt it. <laughs> Will they use the option? No, because the option's out of the money. It has no intrinsic value to it. And so they bought the put option, paid $4 a share, $4 went out, nothing came in for a grand total of minus $4 times 100 shares equals minus $400. And again, that's their premium they paid for it, and that's the worst case scenario. Worst thing that'll ever happen to them is minus four hundred dollars okay. and now profit or loss in a scenario 
Well, they bought the put option for four dollars and it's gone to seven to fourteen dollars. We're we gonna sell would we want to sell something for thirty dollars if we can get it for thirteen? Yeah, I I highly think so. We're gonna exercise our put option and sell ABC stock at the market price at the strike price rather of thirty dollars. Now, if we don't have ABC stock, we gotta go get ABC stock. But what price do we pay for ABC stock? So it kind of help me fill in the charts here, right? You got Alexis, 14. So if 18 went out and 30 came in, what's our grand total? Our total is plus twelve dollars a share times hundred shares equals plus twelve hundred. And that's it. Those are our possible scenarios, fill in the blanks with a long put. But now, of course, we want to take it from the other person's perspective. And we're going to take a look at the short put strategy. This is the person who's right, who sold the put option. Okay, selling puts, is that bullish or bearish? Bullish, bullish, perfect, yes. The person who, right, because the person who bought the put option thinks it's going to go down. So the person who sold them says, no way okay so that's that's their strategy right they think that they think the stock will well either go up or at least stay the same so they can actually be bullish or neutral really but we're going to say right and especially for the test we're going to say that they're bullish all right so the customer sells the abc january 30 put that's a sell to open or an opening sale so our first transaction is to sell something we're going to sell the put for plus four all right and ABC goes to 14, the customer is assigned or exercised, or again, the term is assigned. Maximum gain, loss, break even, or the market goes to 14. What happens in a scenario? Well, first off, they sell the put for $4 a share, their, which, of course, as an option seller, is always their maximum gain. Because if ABC remains above $30, the option buyer is not going to use it because it has no intrinsic value. And if they don't use it, they lose it. And the option hold seller just gets to keep the cash and not have to live up to the contract. And they just account, right? They're just counting 400 bucks. Okay. Now let's assume that the Yashwan, I say, is assigned. So the holder says, I'm going to sell my sell ABC stock to you at $30, like we agreed. They're now contractually obligated to buy ABC stock from them at the strike price of $30. Now, at this moment, 30 went out and four came in. So how much are they out of pocket right now at this particular moment? You got it right. So far at this moment, they're out $26 a share or 2,600. Okay. So therefore, having just bought ABC stock, well, I'm sure they actually don't really want it. So if they sell ABC stock right now, what price would they sell it for? To absolutely just flat out break even, walk away, zero gain or loss, no win, no lose. If they sold it for exactly what price right now, 26, Alexis. Okay, yeah, no need for a question mark. <laughs> I think you're getting the hang of this. <laughs> If they sell this for $26, it was $26. So therefore, a total of $30 went out and a total of 30 came in for a bottom line zero. Okay, so once it goes below $26 though, they're gonna start to lose money. Because, right, because they're, now that they just had to sell the stock, they gotta, right, they just had to buy the stock from somebody. 
And if it keeps going down and down, they're going to lose more money now because they got to get rid of it, right? So, <laughs> okay. So what's the maximum possible loss? Worst case scenario now is they bought the stock for $30 and the absolute worst case possible scenario is ABC stock is bankrupt and the stock is worthless and they sell it for nothing. Well, in that case, a total of 30 went out, a total of four came in. What's their grand total? Right, $26 a share. So notice again, right, the break even point, the break even point was $26, and their maximum possible loss also is $26 a share. Okay, that's not a coincidence, right, that the price per share for the break even and maximum loss are the, are the same thing. Okay, if 30 went out and 4 came in, Then we'd have a bottom line grand total of minus 26 times 100 shares minus 2,600. Maximum possible loss. Now remember, for the option buyer, the maximum possible loss is the premium. The buyer could have lost $400, and that would be the worst. So you notice that the option sell, they got a much higher potential loss, don't they? All right, so let's take a look at a scenario. Uh, the stock goes to $14. The customer is assigned the contract, and they have to buy ABC stock at the strike price of $30. But now that they have it, they don't want it, and they want to get rid of it. So they're going to sell ABC stock for what price? Help me fill in the chart. Right, Ashley? They sell it at the market price of $14. So now, right, so just see, $30 went out and $14 came in. I'm oh, sorry, not $14. $18 came in. Keep me honest on this, okay? <laughs> $18 came in. So win, lose, or draw, and how much? Minus 12, perfect. $12 share times 100 shares per contract equals a minus $1,200. And as we saw earlier, this was the exact same scenario as the long put. In the same scenario, Option put option buyer made 1200, put option seller lost 1200. Okay, now let me go back to this call option here. I'm going to tell you another scenario here. Let's say that in January, ABC is uh, $33. Okay, so they have the January 30 call. Will they exercise the call option? Is this option in the money or out of the money if ABC stock is $33? Is the option in the money or out of the money? Amy says it's in. Does anybody agree? Does anybody disagree? Anna says it's in. Ashley, Alexis, everyone says it's in the money. You are right. The option is in the money by three points. And since it's in the money, the option holder will exercise the option. Okay. They will buy ABC stock at $30. Now that they bought it, they can turn around and sell at the market price of $33. So how they do in this scenario? A total of $34 went out. And a total of $33 came in. What's their grand total? Minus one times 100 shares equals minus $100.
So here's the thing, right? It's like they fight for that. Oh, just changed. So they still lost one hundred dollars. They did. Right. The offer was in the money, right? On expiration date. They won the bet. Only problem is they didn't win by enough. The break-even point was thirty-four dollars. It's got to go above thirty-four before we're gonna show a profit, but it didn't. Now they'd still exercise it, right? They lost hundred dollars, which is better than losing four hundred dollars. Okay. So they'll still exercise the option, but in this case, they're more cutting their losses than actually making profits. Okay. Uh, so they won, it's like, okay, they won the bet, but it's just, they still lost money. Uh, I knew someone who's like, I was tutoring someone who's like big into sports betting and described it says, not only does your team have to win, you got to beat the spread. <laughs> you got to win by enough to cover all your costs. <laughs> so that's, I want to show that as an example where, yes, the option was in the money, the option holder will exercise it. Only thing was they still, it wasn't in the money by enough. It didn't make the break even point. And they still, it was still a losing trade. Just not a worst case scenario. Okay. Uh, all right. What this is we can do here in the time we have remaining is see, there's another ways you can use options. In this case, we're going to use what we just saw is speculation, right? Someone buys or sells an option, making a bet which way it's going to go. Now, that's one way to use options. But another way is you can use them in conjunction with the underlying stock itself. So we can use them together. If someone has a position in the stock, obviously they hope it goes a certain way, but just in case it doesn't work out that way, they can also buy an option as well. Because what does an option do? Let you trade your stock at a fixed price, no matter what the actual price is. This is called a hedging strategy, right? Like hedging your bets. It's to protect your investments because in case it goes the wrong way. You can always tell it's a hedging strategy when someone has a position in the stock and they buy an option to go with it. Always has to be a long option. In this case, they're buying the, the option, not because they think it's going to go a certain way, but in case it goes a certain way, the opposite way that they hoped. <laughs> someone might be long the stock. They own the stock. They must be bullish on the stock. They must want to buy it because they think it's going to go up. But just in case it doesn't go according to plan, what if they also buy a put option? because the put option gives them the right to sell their stock that they own at a fixed price, no matter what the actual price is, so they can get out of their investment at a fixed price and they know what their worst case scenario is. In this case, buying the option is like buying term disaster insurance. Because even if the stock crashes, they can still get out of it at a fixed price. Let's take a look at this transaction here. Again, we're gonna go money out and money in. A customer buys ABC at $50 and buys an ABC January 50 put at $5. ABC goes to 36, which of course is exactly what he did not want to happen. Does that mean now he's like stuck? He's just lost a whole bunch of money? No, because he's got a he's got disaster insurance. He bought the January 50 put, which gives him the right to do what? To sell his ABC stock at $50. Oh, it cut out and I left off. It buys at a fixed price. Um, buys at a fixed price. Okay. Well, by, by having the put option, they have the right to sell ABC stock at a fixed price. Yeah, your voice cut out for a while. Oh, for how long? Uh, 10, se 10 seconds, maybe. Oh, that's awful. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right, but here's the idea, right? They they have a position. They bought the stock. They buy ABC stock. They must be bullish on the stock. So why they buy a put option? Because that's a bearish thing. Are they bullish or bearish? Now the real strategy is the stock itself. That's the reason they bought it. Why they buy the put option? Just in case. <laughs> you why do you buy fire insurance? You don't expect your house to burn down, but just in case. So let's check out what this scenario is. Let's go ahead and say they bought ABC stock for fifty dollars. Okay, so let's uh, let's check that out here. Bought ABC stock for fifty. So let's make a note of that on the money out column. Buy ABC minus fifty, and then they bought the fifty put option. So we're going to buy the put for five dollars. Now between these two things, how much money are they have they spent? This person spent so far. How much are they out of pocket right now? Uh, 
right, Karina, they paid $55 a share so far. So now that they bought ABC stock, of course, sooner or later, they're going to sell ABC stock. But what price will they have to sell it for just to break even? 55. Oops, oh, that should be a plus sign. Because if they did, 55 went out, 55 came in, bottom line zero. So again, by buying this put option, it just raised their break even. It's got to go above $55. They got to cover that cost before they can show a profit. So yes, it's got to go up $5 before they can even show a profit. This does eat into their into their profits. So why did they do that? Okay, because disaster insurance. So first off, what's the maximum possible gain? So the break-even point, we just worked it out. Break-even was 55. Maximum possible gain. Well, once it goes above the break-even point, they're going to start to make money. And the higher it goes, the more money they make. And there's no limit to how high it can go. So therefore, their maximum gain, well, if 55 went out and infinity comes in, what's their maximum possible gain? Fifty-five went out and infinity comes in. Yes. Yeah, Karina, exactly. Unlimited. Plus unlimited. Good. Okay. Yeah, no need for question marks there, right? Okay. You might feel a little hesitant still because it's kind of new, but I think you're kind of getting the hang of it. Maximum possible loss. Well, what again, what's the worst case scenario? Well, they bought ABC stock, and the worst thing that could possibly happen is ABC goes to zero, doesn't it? Have they just lost $55 a share because ABC went to zero? Yes or no? Okay, to repeat the question, the worst thing that could possibly happen, they bought ABC stock, and the company is bankrupt and goes down to zero. They spent $55 so far between these two things. So therefore, if ABC stock is, if stock is worthless, have they just lost $55 a share? Mm -hmm. They would lose all? The answer is no. Why not? Because they bought or long an ABC 50 put option, which means they have the right to sell ABC stock at what price? at $50 a share. So if the stock goes down, if it's below 50, they'll exercise their put option because it's in the money and they'll sell this, they'll sell their ABC stock for $50. Therefore, bottom line, 55 went out and 50 came in. And the grand total is minus five times 100 equals minus equals minus 500. That's why they bought the put option, disaster insurance. And they know that the worst thing that'll happen now is they lose $500. Okay, now mind you, right? It cost them some money, didn't it? Yeah, right? Insurance costs money, but they're okay with that. The whole the idea is whether that's a hedging strategy, they will give up some of the upside because it protects against the downside. Now, what if ABC says it goes to $36? So therefore, ABC goes to $36. Are they going to sell ABC stock for $36? Yes or no? Yes or no? Will they sell the stock for for $36? No. Because they've got the put option, and they will sell it for $36 and get out of it at, at the strike price of 50 And again, they would have lost. Their worst case scenario, again, would have been $500. That's the hedging strategy. That's the protection strategy. Let's put it this way. Buying puts, like I said, it's like buying deserves. What do you call, what do you call the price you pay for insurance? When you write a check to the insurance company? What do you call the price you pay for it? Call a premium, right? 
What's, what do you call the price you pay for an option contract? You call it a premium. That's not a coincidence. Words from the insurance company, from the insurance industry, like, like premium and contract writer, right? They also show up in options because they're used as insurance. Now, I know we saw them, but like when you're making a bet, but you use them as insurance. <laughs> okay, good. Now, when someone sells a stock short, right, a bearish strategy, they profit if the stock goes down and they lose money if it goes up because then they have to replace what they borrowed at higher prices and it keeps going higher, they just lose more money. Okay, so is there a way they can protect that short investment right, from losing too much money? Well, they've got to buy it back eventually. Is there a way that maybe they can lock in a buy price and buy the stock at a fixed price no matter what the actual price is? Yes, <laughs> right? To buy a call option, show short stock, long call is a hedging strategy. Remember, the option in the hedge strategy, the option that they buy is the exact opposite strategy of the stock. And they do that in case, right, <laughs> the opposite of what they want to happen does happen. Money out and money in. A customer sells shorts or shorts 100 ABC of, at $50 and buys an ABC January 4 at, call at 4. Okay, and so we'll write it out. So the first thing he did was an opening sale or sell to open, sell ABC at plus, I'm sorry, yeah, at, uh, plus 50. Okay. But they also bought a call option. So since they're buying something, we put that on the money out column, buy call for minus four. At this exact moment, if 50 came in and four went out, what's their bank account look like now? All right, how much are they up at this moment? Up 46, exactly, exactly, Alexis. So now that they sold ABC stock short, sooner or later they have to replace it by buying ABC stock again. And if they buy it for exactly what price? They will break even. If they buy it for exactly $46, okay, then it was then a total of 50 went out and a total of 50 came in for a bottom line grand total of zero. Once it goes below the break-even point, below $46, then they're going to start to show a profit. But again, notice that the stock has to drop four points before they can show a profit. And if it doesn't drop four points, they still have they still won't have a profit. So the break-even is 46. Okay, maximum possible gain in this scenario. Now, again, as a short seller, they want the stock to fall down. Right, the, and the more it goes down, the more money they make. So once it goes below the break-even point, they're going to start to show a profit if it keeps going down. Now, how far can the stock go down? Well, it could go down as far as zero. Okay. So the stock is worthless. They buy it back for nothing. Okay. So sold it for 50, bought it back for nothing, but it did cost them $4 to protect their investments. Of course, they didn't need their insurance. Okay. Their house didn't burn down. Okay. So $4 went out and 50 came in. What's their total now? What's their grand total? Grand total, right? 40, went, 40 came in, four went out, plus 46 times 100 shares is plus $4,600. Now, true, if he had not bought the put option, he could have made $5,000, right? That would be the maximum gain. But again, they bought the insurance just in case, right? You're never upset if you don't have to use your insurance. So their maximum gain is $4,600. Okay, notice again, the maximum gain price per share is the same as the break-even point. That's, again, that's not a coincidence. All right, maximum possible loss in this transaction. Now, as we know, right? As a short seller, they lose money if it goes up. And if it keeps going up and up, they're going to lose more money. And is there a ceiling, a limit to how high a price stock can go? No, it isn't. So what if it goes up to an infinite amount? Have they just lost infinity? Yes or no? Do they have conceivably unlimited losses in this transaction? Okay. Alexis says yes. Anybody agree? 
Karina says no. Well, can we get a tiebreaker here? Okay. All right. Some folks we haven't heard from yet. So, um, okay. Ashley says yes. Let's see. Who we haven't heard from? Like Colby. <laughs> oh, Alicia says yes. Colby, what do you think? Unlimited loss in this transaction? Because EBC stock goes to infinity? And the answer is no. Why? Hedging, right? To protect their investments. Because by buying the ABC January 50 call, he's got the right to buy ABC stock at the strike price. He can buy ABC for $50, no matter what the actual price is. So therefore, 54 went out and 50 came in. And therefore, their breath right, right loss was a total of total of minus four times 100 equals minus $400. That's the maximum loss, their worst case scenario. That's why they bought the call option. They bought disaster insurance. Because remember, from this person's perspective, it goes up, it's a disaster. <laughs> if ABC goes to $66, well, same thing happens, right? He's not gonna have to replace it at 66. He's gonna use his call option and call it from someone, call it away from someone else or call it to him at $50 a share. So therefore, right, his again loss would be four hundred dollars. Right, and low is the worst case scenario. All right, <laughs> okay, that's how we do it. So just remember, be cautious. We got to watch out for that because sometimes it's easy to forget that that put that that option that they bought lets them get out of their investment at a fixed price. So always look whenever. Okay, if they have a position of stock and they buy or they're long an option contract. In this case, they're using the option as disaster insurance. Okay, in fact, I went to a I went to a seminar, right? They were talking about using put options as a hedge, and like their whole thing was we always buy put options, and describes like insurance. Okay, yeah, you're you're not upset if you're right. You're not. It, do you feel like you wasted your money if you bought fire insurance and your house didn't burn down, right? Or you didn't get into a car crash, but you still bought car insurance? Okay, then don't be upset about losing money on put options if you okay. Yeah, okay, right. So that's that. And he said, How many of you, right? Your portfolio is burning down right now, but you have no insurance. Okay. All right. Last thing I want to do here before we wrap up today is I'm going to show you again a little trick that I did when I was taking my test. I knew that options are contracts between two investors. And I've always heard these stories about some business deal getting done. They write a contract on the back of a cocktail napkin, and the next thing you know, they got a $10 billion business. So it's a contract. So I would write a contract. I would like take a sticky note or something and I would write on it. So something like call option. I have the right to buy 100 shares of fill in the blank stock at fill in the blank price by fill in the blank date. That's what a contract is. That's what a call option is. So if the test question says someone buys a call option, okay, like the one back here, someone buys a call option, then in my head, I give somebody money, they give me a piece of paper. Now, I'd like to see if this piece of paper is profitable for me to use it by the time it expires. If it is, right, I have the right to buy it at $30 and it's worth $47. i am gonna go buy whoever I bought this from, I'm gonna stick this piece of paper under their nose, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna buy ABC stock from $30, call it to me at $30 like we agreed. So now I can buy it at 30 and sell it at 37. That's what I'm hoping to do. But if a January comes around, ABC is still less than thirty dollars, and it says I have the right to buy it for thirty. Am I going to buy? Am I going to use this contract? Am I going to use this thing? I don't think so. I'm not going to buy it for thirty dollars if it's worth twenty-seven. So this this is a losing ticket at the racetrack, right? Tear it and toss it. <laughs> okay. On the other hand, if the test question says someone sells an option or the writer of an option or short the option. Okay, someone sells the January 30 call, then in my head, somebody gives me money and I give them a piece of paper. And you know what I'd like them to do now? I'd like them to walk, watch them walk away and tear it and toss it. And I'm still holding on to their cash. And I'm hoping ABC is going to stay below 30 because no one's going to come back to me and buy it for 30. 
they're going to take they're going to tear it and toss it and i'm holding on to their money that's what i want to see but it could happen if abc goes above 30 dollars in january they're going to come back to me and stick this piece of paper under my nose and say i'm going to buy abc stock from you like we agreed well it's a contract so i got to do what the contract says i got to sell it to them at 30. anyway by going on a piece of paper like this it just made it help it make more real for me right instead of vague concept it was at least something now i can see and touch made it more real for me so i did that in my in my head when passing around this piece of paper like i'm pretending to and it just helped me out get this concept down a little bit better after a while i didn't need the piece of paper anymore because i just practiced it enough that i knew what there was doing i knew what was going on <laughs> okay all right well we're exactly at uh, 8 45 and this is the time i'm supposed to let you out the door <laughs> Okay, how do we get? Yeah, we went all the way here. Yes. So in that case, let's come back on Wednesday. All right. So tune in Wednesday. Same that time, same that channel. <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, I have graded right. I've checked your scores as of yesterday. Updated your scores as I saw them. I put them into into Canvas. There's still some. Uh, areas like that, there's some that you know you can fill in some gaps here, right? Get some extra score, some extra points. Uh, if you're finding you're falling behind time, this is the time to help get you back up to speed. Let me know how I can help you out. All right, if you're falling behind right now, let, let's set up a time to talk, okay? Uh, send me an email, we'll spend some time together and we'll work it out and it'll help you get back to speed, okay? Alexis, yes. I noticed two of the quizzes that I didn't get the 70% on. I don't have a score in Canvas. Is that because I didn't make the 70? Correct. So when I do retake it to get the 70, let you know and to put the grade in? That's correct. Okay. I mean, I'll find okay. out when I, you know, when I log into the uh, past perfect and I see everybody's scores. Okay. Okay. But yeah, that's what it means, right? Um, in fact, actually, Bill at the school said I, I should start putting in zeros in that spot so that that'll give you this visual saying, oh, there's something that you might be missing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you hadn't hit this, by the way, remember the you can retake uh, those uh, those little quizzes. You can retake the chapter exams. You can retake the mastery exams, and I'll give you your highest score. Because to me, the the way to pass this test to success, take practice exams a lot, a lot, a lot. Try to exhaust the bank of test questions. <laughs> okay, all right, that wraps things up for today, everybody. We'll see you again soon, and please make sure make this a resource. And I'll see you again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.